Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Value of Everything. So, had a little bit of time uh, yesterday, and thought it would be rather interesting to review Mr. Donald Trump's policies. I guess he's a runner at the moment, so he's not really putting down much in a manifesto to state, right, this is what I'm going to do, here's the plan. He's basically going to the public. It's sort of a popular popularity contest, and usually with a lot of um, presidential candidates, they will Talk the talk and get the populist view coming out. And then once they're in power, then they can put forward any of the policies that they really choose to. And they can sort of back down from policies. But it will be interesting just to review a few of what Donald Trump has spoken about in the past and see where basically he's positioned and what kind of president that America and the world will get in 2016. My luck's on. Right, so, Donald Trump, let's go through, um, I'm, I'm going through a number of policies, I've got a little bit of knowledge about where he stands now. Beforehand, I think on a previous podcast, I was just mentioning about a few little topics that just bumped into my head. I think the main point I was getting to is that Donald Trump has this potential to be a person that might not be able to take advice from others. Uh, he potentially, obviously in a business sense, would be able to. He has to hire professionals to carry out certain surveys and report data and then use that information to make the wisest choices in his businesses. However, he possibly won't meet somebody that's on the same level. So let's think in the terms of like a Chinese president then that's going to be a different situation for Donald Trump. And seeing that he does have a certain air of, I'm the big guy around here, that might suggest to be a slightly problematic. I mean, I am only predicting the future. I cannot really claim to know Donald Trump in any way, shape or form. But let's just put forward what he has said and try and predict certain things that he could carry out in the future. Uh, just to give you an, a brief explanation of myself, I am a philosopher, like to think about things in general and try and get both sides of the scale. But in general, my political leaning is in the field of capitalism, which is kind of a keen to Donald Trump. However, I do not like the use of force. So I'm a very peaceful natured man. So whenever I get terminologies like uh, we're going to bomb fields and things like that, then that's where I, I get slightly nervous. So uh, the, the main terminology is anarcho-capitalist from my perspective, but if we, um, I'll try and give a fair and balanced opinion of Donald Trump, but it's always interesting to see, uh, see it from other people's perspective before we go any further. So a few of his policies, let's go through abortion. Now abortion, uh, the really interesting thing about other countries is that abortion isn't really a big deal in the UK. It's not really um, one of the headline topics of debate. I guess this is because US is more religiously inclined. 
However, in a moral perspective, if you have sex which uh, where you never used any protection and it was just a one night stand and all of those things, then really it's not the fetus's fault that you've created this child. It's more so the responsibility of the the mother that has conceived. However, in terms of the use of force, if she had conceived by an act of rape, then that's a totally different matter because she has been well the force has been used at that at that respect so therefore in an act of self defense your the body's defense then you can permit a abortion that's i think that's a general moral perspective which i think can be applicable in terms of abortion now when it comes to Donald Trump, he is pro-life, which does meet the markers of morality. And he also agrees in the terms that there should be a ban on late abortions, which I think is quite agreeable, and exceptions for rape, incest, and whether that could kill the actual mother itself so that's another moral question whether to kill the mother in instead of the the child well in general usually you require the mother for the child in the first place so it's best to keep the mother around in um, there and she may have other children to look after in itself so in theory, in that respect, the the mother's going to come first in that in that perspective in morality. There's other little uh, nuances that you can add to that argument, but in general, for a moral perspective, I believe that's where it stands. I think that's the most coherent argument there. So, yeah. So economy now, where you ha would have a a very conservative president, particularly when he's got a very high business acumen, he's worth in the multiple billions of money. He he's going to be theoretically quite good in the way that he manages his own business. So you'd expect that that would apply both to his to the American economy that he could he would be managing but we have got a few little quotes in the past he does mention that if America's debt not deficit but debt so deficit is the interest that you're paying but the debt is the total amount the total sum reaches 24 trillion I'm not sure if this is a factual point or not, but he said this in June 2015. That is the point of no return. I'm not quite sure exactly where we are with American debt, especially if you start to type into the figures the unrealized debts which are going to occur in the future. Pension funds, things like that. Um, with that sort of terminology, it does he does send a certain amount of fear and obviously he is very aware it's a good thing that he's very aware of the state of the economy and he is willing to mention that we or sorry or the americans are in a dire situation which could get become to a point of no return so at least he is very economically aware in those terms so that can be a very big positive for a president particularly when he is going to take over one of the most debt-ridden economies the world has ever seen. Now, another thing I'd like to add to that, um, which is interesting with Donald Trump, is that he actually has experienced bankruptcy in the past before. So it's kind of interesting that somebody with that experience 
can come into presidency and has experience in terms of managing an economy and has experience with bankruptcy of his business so that's very useful things to master instead of being just a lawyer also he he has mentioned before in 2000 that the up and coming crash is going to be bigger than 1929 so he's he's fully aware of these humongous problems and i think a lot of politicians do not really get a good grasp of the economy you never get economists being put in charge of the well you do in in terms of like advisors but the actual president itself is not really an economist so it's it's very good and interesting that you've got somebody that is very wary and quite concerned of the state of the economy and has experienced bankruptcy and is and does know how to manage a multi-billion business empire so let's move on to more moral subjects now we go on to civil rights civil rights so same-sex marriage is an issue uh, this is what donald trump has mentioned same same-sex marriage is a state issue so he's doesn't seem to be really one way or the other but back in 2011 he did mention that there should be no gay marriage no same-sex partner benefits <clears throat> so in terms of that that's fairly grounded i guess if i try and add a few things to the moral argument of that there's there is no harm whatsoever for two people to marry they're not doing anybody any else any harm in that respect so there is there's literally no problem with the terms of a gay marriage now <clears throat> when we come to add children in a gay marriage the argument would be obviously if you if there is a child that is raised in a, a very abuse abusive family obviously being raised by gay parents who are good natured and kind and do not abuse the child is going to be a better place than for them to be in an abusive environment however there is certain elements which might be missing in terms of if you do have a mother and a, a father figure then you do have those certain types of emotional figures which do have certain qualities that same-sex partnerships may not have i guess you do have dominant a dominant um more dominant one and a less dominant one in relationships but in general if you from a child's perspective there is certainly there's something missing in terms of emotional differences between the interactions between a father figure and a mother figure that's the only sort of argument but in terms of a, an abusive environment there's you would always pick for for the child to be if i'm talking about a very heavily abusive environment you're going to always have a gay marriage raising that child in comparison to them being belted and whipped and shoved soap up their mouth and all that kind of stuff so yeah that is the general moral perspective i think i think i'm pretty much bang on that if you can throw in some counter arguments for me i will be more than happy to check them out <clears throat> so yeah so it's interesting where we go to the to the moral perspectives of those i think so far we're pretty donald trump's looking quite good where it comes to corporations now a corporation is shielded by the state there's no self-ownership by ceos that's hence why you don't get a load of bankers after 
the 2007 crisis being held accountable and responsible of the business's actions you have the shareholders and it's a legal status which creates an entity to shield them so corporations are kind of a tricky subject especially for an anarchic capitalist perspective now a capitalist perspective would understand that businesses are the lifeblood to the government so really if you would like to be a very profitable a well-managed economy you would like to have the lowest tax po possible for your businesses however we call it corporation tax so Donald Trump has been ve very good in terms of his terminology for taxation for the corporations. So he says that 0% corporation tax would create millions of jobs, which is a true statement. This is back in 2011. So we're looking at quite some, some very old arguments here. Also, this is an extremely positive argument as well. Uh, fight crony capitalism with a level playing field. So when we mention crony capitalism, this is where the interaction between the government and the, uh, the corporations. So Donald Trump has got some experience with this. I'm sure if you're going to build some humongous hotels in some very highly regulated areas in New York City, then you're going to have to be involved in a few chinwags with political leaders. And if you are inclined to make speeches and say that you're against crony capitalism, that's, that's fairly a positive thing. And if he's more akin to creating a level playing field, <clears throat> and making businesses more responsible then that would be a fantastic thing however obviously we're looking at something that he's saying now in back in a few years ago and once he reaches the terms of presidency it might be different one of the interesting perspectives for donald trump is that he doesn't really need loads of corporate corporation money to push his presidency campaign forward because he is self-made so that is very interesting so he he doesn't necessarily need to be swayed by what the corporations want and ask for so whereby uh, one of the one of the more the, the big cases that are coming forward at the moment that rather than high fat foods are really dangerous for you sugars are extremely um, can be extremely dangerous for you and especially the t types of sugars that the food industry are putting into our diets, he may not be supplied by Coca-Cola anymore, and he can actually look into that and say, okay, well, yeah, I, I agree. Sugars are quite harmful. Maybe we m may need to put certain... Uh, what's the word? Packaging information on our food products things like that who, who knows but this is like a he, he's got the control of regulation i would from a non-centralized basis i would always be suggestive of letting companies do that on their own basis so that you'd have like some kind of website that could highlight to you the dangers of sugar and and a number of those problems to the health and therefore where there's a conflict of interest between a corporation and Donald Trump, he may be very good in that respect because he doesn't necessarily need the funding from the corporation. I guess he will need corporate um, helps at certain points from corporations, but I guess that there's going to be a certain bittersweet relationship between the corporation and Donald Trump. Donald Trump may be more inclined for increasing America's competitiveness However, if he's very anti-corporation and saying, right, you're going to be more responsible for what you're doing, then the corporation is going to be like, oh, we can't stand this Donald Trump. Let's get him out of there. Um, one other 
interesting thing about well we could talk about the corporations or the rich or the the super rich is that Donald Trump has mentioned before that there will be one one-off rich tax maybe something of the net worth of 14% and that could dramatically reduce America's debt so that's an interesting theory and I I guess a lot of the politicians all have been doing is just kicking the can down the road Donald Trump has got a certain theory of a solution compared to most of the other runners who just choose to pile on a load more debt and um, increase the money supply so that that could diminish the def the the deficit which they're paying or the debt that they're going to be paying off and then hopefully one day the the gdp can increase so much to overtake the size of the debt which hasn't been happening for quite some time still so that's that's a really interesting theory there's there's uh, economists have been putting forward a, a number of um suggestions as to how to solve the problems of the economy there is the terminology so in theory the the answers to the 2007 crisis was to give corporate um, banks the major institutional banks an excess supply of liquidity that enabled to increase the um, the the housing market and keep the funding to the housing market and keep the co major corporations in play in the, the state that they were but the problem was that the money wasn't trickling down to the people where all the debt lay to the actual personal debt the actual corporations didn't really hold too much in the way of debt so the theory was debt relief so we would write off debt so this is another um, argument you can write off debt of people so you can say anybody who's got uh, 10 grand's worth of debt then you can get that wiped off if you have no debt whatsoever you get 10 grand straight into your account and thus that could write off the debts and reduce personal debt and reinflate the economy again also you can take money from the rich and that can write off a, cer a certain level of debt so these are two good at least there are arguments of how to restructure the debt and to get to a state where the economy is creating and moving forward again but we're still in a corptocracy now but good on T donald trump for putting forward a argument of how to reduce the debt Next one's up is capital punishment. So I'll give you the, the moral argument. So if if you if somebody perpetrates a murder and then you murder them back, then then you, in theory, I guess if you're you're just what's the word you're trying to carry out your justice however you're just being as bad as what they are by murdering them i don't think i explained that that perfectly but in a moral sense it's best not to do as what a criminal should do um but from the perspective of donald trump he has mentioned in the past that capital punishment isn't uncivilized murdering living is so yeah so he's he's stating that the the problem with that is he's he's done a word play there because one is murdering of the state and the other is murdering of a, an individual so somebody is murdering an individual and then the state kills them so um it's it's an interesting perspective america is seems to be a little bit more on its own compared to the other western nations the other western nations seem to be a bit more f further forward in terms of the moral argument of capital punishment but donald trump is looking at it in maybe a, a very uh, a 
not well thought out structured um, mythology i guess you've got some good arguments for capital punishment what's the point of imprisoning somebody for their life that's an intense amount of cost and and what you could just dispose of that person they're a waste of society and therefore we could cut down the cost and we wouldn't have any of these problems However, when it comes to morality, we have some very big questions as to why, if we are the, the state, or if we are the wise uh, philosopher kings of the government, why would be, we be acting just as callously as the murderer itself? There's some other things in terms of... Donald Trump's terms of the law. In terms of sentencing, he has mentioned hold judges accountable, do not reduce sentences. Uh, also, he's mentioned for tough anti-crime policies. So he, he, he's pro-tough anti-crime policies, not criminal rights. So... We are going to supply a lot of prisoners to the prison system. So it's, it's kind of um, a little bit awkward there. Um, the prison system, there is a, a, a basically a, biz, a big business funding in terms of the prison states. So uh, there's a lot of private prisons in America. And they can support the the politicians. I guess Donald Trump is a little bit more harder to be um, a supporter of. But Donald Trump uh, is quite pro prisons. Now, there is one little moral objective thing here. Now, I guess if somebody there, these are violent criminals, then. In acts of self-defense, the government can protect its people by imprisoning them away from society. And after a certain level of time, once these young 20-year-olds get into their 50s and they get back released to the society, they're not going to be quite as violently prone as what they were in their 20s. That is a methodology of applying, and it, in, th in theory, it does work. Now... It's all well and good if violent criminals are sentenced. However, if it's the war on drugs and people are supplying drugs to one another, therefore there is no complainant in the trade, it's not an immoral act. And I guess you can harm somebody if somebody supplies something uh, a bad drug, but then that is definitely a violent crime. If you if you knew about it, there's certain uh, elements of negligence which is um, applied there in terms of morality. However, if you're supplying somebody a high and they get high, there is no real moral consequence of that. There's obviously a lot of things in terms of why that person is always chasing those highs, but. In terms of uh, the war on drugs, it is generally immoral. Now, from Donald Trump's, Trump's perspective, he is pro-legalizing drugs and using tax revenue to fund drug education. That's a fantastic argument for a politician, in my opinion. Now, I guess if he's... I'm sure by the tax revenue by of legalizing drugs, you're not just going to have that revenue um, funding drug education because that drug education campaign will be tremendous. You would probably be able to release about 14 movies a week in terms of the amount of, <laughs> of pro um, propaganda against taking drugs. And you probably could eradicate it in that terms. But in in those respects, what's going to happen is you're going to get a certain level of tax revenue and you're going to use it for other things. And the drug edu education bill will be probably no more than about 2% of the revenue there. Now, in, um, so 
that's a very interesting argument to put forward. I guess in terms of a philosopher, a philosopher would say that really it's up to us to be self-disciplined and to really make the decisions in our lives to not take not chase all these highs and maybe question why we're chasing these highs and really helping out others who may be inclined to taking these highs so it really it really boils down to ourselves it shouldn't really be the fact of taxation which is taken away from us at force to come back to us and educate us so that's the the moral argument back against that but even so it's probably one of the most um what's the word modernist arguments that's probably put, been put forward for the drugs bill prohibition against alcohol was a complete failure and did create uh, a massive criminal underculture and with the prohibition of all other drugs like marijuana we still have this criminal underworld which exists However, if you legitimize it and create a trading platform which is regulated, self-regulation is better, but if it's regulated, then you potentially have less of a safety issue. I know that there is a certain argument that you're making drugs more accessible to people that wouldn't necessarily have drugs in their lives. So there is counter argument to get that against that. It's better to just um, stop the supply of that in in all realms and respects. However, if somebody's really seeking out drugs, they're going to find it eventually. So it's it's one of those awkward situations with with the actual supply of, and of drugs. Let me just go over another argument with um, well, not an argument, but just a, a th things that Donald Trump has stated about drugs as well. He's um, he never drinks, smokes, nor does drugs. So that's kind of interesting, especially if you're going to put forward those arguments. But he still is quite acceptant of, I guess, if people were at his hotel, they do drink, do take drugs. I'm sure he probably has smoking balconies at his hotels. So he does accept that people do do these things and he... He has to allow that sort of thing to happen on his premises. I'm sure he's he's a wise man to say if he wanted to set up his own hotel, which was totally a total non-banning, banned smoking perimeter and no drinks allowed on premises, then he wouldn't be running a fairly he wouldn't be running a very successful hotel chain. So, in respect of drugs, he's. I guess he's, well, these are the soft drugs which are legalized and part of society, so it's not really, it's, it's not that hard to sort of put around there. But he's obviously very aware of getting drinking licenses, probably licenses that go further into the later hours for his hotels. So it's interesting in that terms that he is aware of working around dr drug policies. Um... Let's move on. Now, in terms of education, Mr. Donald Trump is interested in cutting the Department of Education way, way down. This is comments quite recently. So that can concern, especially the left side of... side of the political persuasion now state funded education is a very tricky subject just to just to go on just to like delve into it a little bit state education is sort of a little bit to do with if you look into the prussian i think it's prussian schooling method if you just google that i'm sure it's going to come up into some um, realm for for many many years people were self-educating their children and it was fairly successful to an extent there was a lot of book reading people when people and parents were focused upon their children's education then there was a lot more in terms of the literacy rate and a number of other things. I guess you could say, okay, well, there's some parents that are unable, unable to educate their children. 
However, I would say that if parents, when it comes to educating, I think if you spoke to many teachers, it doesn't necessarily happen have to be to about the actual pupils but the actual parents itself now if the parents are really in tune to helping their children educate themselves then you're going to get children with who are going to be quite successful in terms of their academic grades um, they might have certain learning difficulties but still they will be able to push them a lot more forward in comparison to parents that do not even try so where we have state funded uh, schooling systems that takes away the responsibility of the ch um, the parents and they think okay well we'll just send them to this school and that should do the job for them and usually we don't we don't find that the children come out of there really that well educated and there's still a lot of literacy rates which are going downwards and downwards in, compar in comparison to the 1900s so some interesting things I just want to fire out there in terms of the education system. Now, if you obviously, if you did take away the education system, it is a source of the parent or the single parent going to work. So it's in an economic structure sort of things. If you did say, OK, well, I, I, when he says take it, things were well, way, way down, I'm sure he, he's going to still keep a state school funding system together not completely obliterate it but if he did really push it to its extremes and said okay right parents are responsible for their children's education you can access education um, via the internet there's many means and ways that you can go to self um, private schools you can do it all on your own it's all out there you can you can deregulate the system so that people can educate themselves in many um, ways shapes and forms and people can pursue whatever whatever disciplines they want to um, pursue it, it could produce a number of very specialist uh, specialized people that were highly educated in comparison to having a state funded uh, curriculum which gives you not many applicable skills which can be applied to the workforce so if he did cut those um, way way down the, there is certain leftist arguments to say well we're not children ch ch um, educating the children and then the parents what are they going to do if you're a single mother you're going to how, how are you going to educate your child if there's no state school around? Um, it does sort of cater back into the original thing of the family and how important the family is. So that is, again, again very pro-family. Interesting arguments. Um, is, I'm obviously throwing out a number of like, theories here, but I can't, really be, um, I can't really substantiate what exactly he means by in the education system way way down but it is interesting in those terms uh donald trump has created universities in terms of deal making and negotiating so that is kind of interesting in those terms uh what else in terms of also he likes to bring on competition and tearing down union walls so that's interesting in those terms so making the schools a little bit more competitive, enabling teachers to be fired and enabling schools to be run like businesses so that the more successful schools are, the more the people want to go there and the less successful schools are, the least amount of um, people go there. So that does, that does swing in terms of um, a very good structure for education. I, I can't necessarily disagree with many of those things. I guess if you're a single parent, it's not going to be very helpful for you in a very short amount of time. But in terms of long-term goals for education, I think that's some fairly good arguments from Donald Trump. Let's go down to energy and oil. So Donald Trump is against climate change he believes that climate change is a hoax and he's mentioned that fairly recently in 2015 
he also is very pro oil he's he says that he says that there is a big interest in the economy having tons of oil supplied it does enable us to increase the economy and the gdp and provide much more goods and trade so depending on where you are on the climate change arguments when it when it comes down to a point of a uh, government requesting taxation in terms of how much you pollute that's kind of it's like a stealth tax which is being created and modeled by the government and states it's fairly dangerous uh in terms of a government saying okay well this is how much uh, carbon pollution that you're creating and you should be giving us that much in terms of tax particularly when there is a number of science articles which um argue against the terms of climate change there is more of rather than just one type of uh theory as to the causation of climate change there is a number of other theories as to what causes climate change as to uh rather than looking at our co uh, our carbon emissions there is certain arguments that the sun goes through various cycles of cold patterns and hot patterns so just to actually look at the source of our heating is or the actual climate change um is very interesting in terms of the deal so and there has been a number of scientific studies which has been carried out by government organizations so there is there is a lot of potential conspiring which is happening in terms of carbon credit plans by governments so there is there is awful a lot of things to mention there but also on the on the on the other side it is an important topic for people and people are very obviously want to be sustainable in their environment and not just pollute it until we create this big black smog hole if you look at china there even even though they've been heavily industrialized now they're trying to fight back against um the pollution of their air and their environment and how it's causing certain um damages there is certain arguments in terms of if we leave it too late then there'll be an irreversible state which we cannot return from however there has been certain arguments that have been put forward that um CO2 emissions uh carbon um, emissions have been high much higher in the past of um our natural history of the planet earth in comparisons to now and if you think that carbon uh, or co2 emissions is what um, trees breathe in the first place it's kind of interesting there's also arguments that plankton in the sea which creates uh, more oxygen than the actual trees itself it's, there's lo lots of information out there it's really hard to get a, a grasp of actually what is going on in terms of climate change but i guess it's important to just stay very wary of it and what is the and uh from Donald Trump's perspective, I guess you could say climate change is a, is a hoax, but it would be fairly nice if he said, I would like to have nice breathable air, I would like to have a sustainable future for America, and, and make those certain arguments rather than just discrediting uh, a certain part of the scientific community. Now, moving on families and children so like this is this is a f very important thing for a politician a politician doesn't really mention too many things about this in the first place other than he'll just like say some glory little tale of some beautiful little uh, family and how he how they or he or she supports the family but never really sort of mentions the influences of the government onto the family itself and how it's structured and the government has an incredible amount of effect on how the family is structured and what it does um in terms of being making both well i think most families now require two parents to work to sustain the fairly average model of having a three bedroom house and uh, a car and all of those things so um we have changed quite some uh, quite a lot since the 1950s and 1960s where you would just have the one man going out to work 
and he would be the breadwinner and the woman could stay at home to spend 100% of their time to looking after the children in the household and being a social member of the community. So uh, not to say that you can reverse those roles. Those roles doesn't, doesn't necessarily need mean to be those ways, but I guess in terms of breastfeeding, if you look at the scientific data, breastfeeding is very beneficial for children. So especially for the first few months, it's important that um, a woman's can care for the child right okay so donald trump has mentioned that uh, or has stressed the importance of a strong family and culture of life now we've really got not much to work on i guess he's pro family i guess if he says the family doesn't exist and i don't th and everyone's just out there to get what they can get i think obviously that would not really get <laughs> many votes at all but if he has uh, stressed the importance of the family, that's uh, every every politician is going to mention this anyway. It's not. I don't think there's any really going to be any um, good arguments against against this. I mean, the, the 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 area that you could sort of channel into is that we are going to be more about the family and less about the single person. So we're going to tax the single person more so than the than the family member. You could also go to the. Um, this is another more of a more of a uh, harder tone, you could say, okay, well, we're more interested in, in the family, the two-parent family and the single mother family. We, we need to give them less credits and really just say that this, um, that this uh, thing of society is not the way to go and uh, the mother and father um, families is the most important, is the most important for raising children. So therefore, this is the structure that we're going to apply. And I'm going to um, change the tax system to uh, reflect that. So, but I mean, I've, I'm just putting out these arguments. I don't think that we can really determine, any, determine anything in terms of what has been mentioned there. But it is... I guess it's fairly okay if he could say he, he stresses the importance of a strong family. Foreign policy. Now, this is one of the areas I get a little bit uh, concerned. So, Donald Trump is very pro military and he likes to exercise his military force in a lot of um, realms. He has mentioned about taking over oil fields in foreign countries, um, particularly ISIS countries, and creating a perimeter and selling them to Exxon and all of the American oil companies. So this militarist ideal doesn't really go down too well with the Middle East. It does inflate a lot more in terms of infighting and you're going to get more potential terrorism acts which occur. I, I do believe that Donald Trump is very much against for the, the war on terror. So there is certain arguments out there that there is this military industrial complex which is the biggest arm of the, the american state and because the um, the military industrial complex has all the spy uh, agencies it can work out what porn sites you've been on and a number of other things to discredit you in a matter of seconds you will um, it's not worth the fight to fight against the military industrial complex. So Donald Trump is extremely pro-military in these terms. Now, also, when you put somebody in power who is um, who has been in business power, it's a certain there's a certain difference between business power and full full blown military nuclear arsenal power. Because when you're going to the negotiating table, which Donald Trump appears to be one of these uh, proponents of very strong, hard negotiating, I think he has, does mention before it's the, probably the, some of the best ways are to come away from the deal where both are winners. But let's just state that he's a very strong negotiator and he's mentioned before that a lot of the trade agreements that have been put in place are dreadful for America. But if he is thinking of meddling so much with 
the oil fields and getting America what they want. And uh, when you love America, you protect it with no apologies. He's mentioned that before. And this is um, this is some of the interesting, well, not interesting, kind of uh, worrying points he's mentioned before. China is our enemy. They're biking us for billions. Uh, by 2027, the tsunami as China overtakes us as the largest economy. Be tougher on China. We're too eager to please. Obviously... America, the relationship between America and China is, is very important, especially on the, the global scale. And if you do have one side, this emerging economy, which is, is going to be improving in a lot of ways and is trying to become a Western economy. And then you have America, who's got still the biggest military force in the world, uh, but obviously the biggest debt. And you've got China, who owns all the bonds, which uh, run the 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 American economy, well, not all of them, but uh, is a big shareholder of the, of of them. And if they did decide to sell all the bonds into the market, that could be a big economic uh, backlash. So I'm just thinking in terms. I mean, I'm I'm just theorising here. This is nothing really um, substantial. But if Donald Trump does go hardball with his negotiations, does go a little bit militarist militarist in terms of taking over oil fields and resources, which China is very interested in itself. I, I mean, I guess China's been paying for its stuff. I mean, it's not really, it's not been using the, the military to take over things. It has been trying to pay for things. So you could legitimize um, China's uh, uh, way of doing things in comparison to America's way of doing things sometimes. So... If we get to a, a certain situation where there is disagreements that are being put in place, um, with Donald Trump, he's usually the big business guy and he puts forward, right, I'm going to buy this many carpets for my hotel. You either take that price or you can walk away. It's, there's a little, there's a definite few more nuances which are occurring on the negotiating table, even for the small guys. Now, I, I, with, with China, I guess he's going to have to, He's going to have to be a little bit more wiser. There's a lot more shit that can go down when he does mess around with China itself. So I, I, as, as hawkish and um, has, as kind of tricky as he, as he can be, I guess it's not going to happen. But when it comes to the emerging economies, you, you do sort of sense to think, okay, this big, powerful president that goes, you either like it or lump it. And the way that he, he pushes himself, especially when it comes to um, working with working with mexico it's kind of like right you have it either have it my way or the highway it's and in terms of the way that he he talks and um, you, you would think that he would be uh, fairly up to scratch with protectionism and how that can be kind of disastrous but he does mention a lot of times in terms of outsourcing jobs and and things like that. He's very prote protectionist. I've mentioned this a few times before in my previous um, podcast that protectionism is a fairly dangerous thing to go down, particularly for a economy. So if he starts becoming very protectionist and using economic uh, ways to fight against other countries, which he's quite used to in the business sphere, um, say, okay, right, we're going to put an import tax on all Chinese goods or Chinese manufactured goods, and we're going to try and bring back all the manufacturing um, plants that are in America, uh, in, in China, back to America, then there could definitely be economic warfare. Economic warfare is probably the, the dangerous thing which could come out in terms of what Donald Trump being in power could do. I think that's probably the, the the most dangerous thing that can happen, especially when you've got the hardest negotiator of all time. I do really hope that he is more so inclined to making win win arguments rather than being take it or take it or leave it arguments, because particularly in the state of the world geopolitical systems. We're going to have some very tricky uh, situations to negotiate through. And particularly when there is definitely covert operations, I guess America's spy networks has a number of ways to watch the Chinese. 
as do the Chinese to the Americans. So um, where we are quite used to having a, a normal standard war of army and military men, there is the potential of economic warfare and of uh, high-tech warfare as well. So it's it's kind of worrying in terms of what Donald Trump is mentioning, and you do feel like we're going down the foreign policy method of being very protectionist, and that can be very disastrous for the world economy and could bring us backwards in years compared to forwards in years if we do really want to create a free market trading environment which um, makes us more progressive, uh, um, reskill and recalibrate ourselves into learning about 3D printing or high-tech manufacturing or the uh, the sphere of the internet and how we can create different worlds and um, places in in a virtual reality environment which we can fully connect to in some kind of singularity cloud network there's many economic ways that we can improve we can uh, minimize the size of our houses and be a little bit more sustainable in smaller things so there's literally thousands of things which um, the economy can boost up into which are on the on the plate, but if we start going down the route of protectionism, that can be very disastrous for the world at a whole. And free trade and uh, the free market is the uh, the real route to prosperity, not protectionism. There is plenty of books out there which can argue um, for the free market, and I think it's pretty well substantiated. But let's um, let let me just put those thoughts out to you um, first and foremost. If you think there's some great counter arguments to get for protectionism of America, please let me know. Um, free trade, which is a, a good topic. So it's a um, Donald Trump has mentioned before that China and um, Japan is beating us. We can beat China. So yeah, there's there's that still that little bit of nationalism, which I'm a little bit against nationalism as a whole. Um, I am all for the reduction of the state to the as a slow progression till you get to a minicus state, and then once you get to a certain level and you can apply certain levels and you can work and work out things and you can you can work out how to run the military and the law courts without the state, then we can push over to the full in our co economy. But until that happens, uh, we've got to worry about full nationalism and creating these supersized militarist um, countries because it doesn't really do t um, too much increasing the, the wealth of the people of this planet. Right. Um, obviously, he's, he's mentioned, uh, and I, I've, I've made this point just before in terms of emerging markets he mentions putting a 35 percent import tax on the mexican border uh there's been and 20 percent tax on all imported goods so he's 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 very protectionist and yeah that 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 never really goes down well when you're this great negotiator in terms of that now i guess I guess he's probably very good in his business sense, being very protectionist in his business sense. And in, in terms of um, laws and law courts, I guess he could have a few lawyers thrown at him to um, argue and battle out, and he's probably got a good set of lawyers to protect him. Um, and not really much of a fallout happens, but if you start uh, not making friends by having these high import taxes then there are always not you're not just going to get your lawyers that going to come against you there are many means and ways that you can start to come back at this country you can choose to not trade in with that country for other means you could start saying okay well these american goods we're going to start raising our import tax so that just as a kickback back and forth pretend until you're creating a very isolated economy and it doesn't have the ability to have a free trading network and there's resources that America needs and there's resources that China needs and it's not going to help if they create these big walls if you think of China where it's tried to be a very isolated economy and not had too much of an out 
a, a touch with the outside world. Um, it's been stuck in that structure for many hundreds of years until it's really emerged into the global sphere and it's really gone like major ways. So there's there's some a certain argument of protectionism and st sticking to your own sort of uh, into your own little world. But there's 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 that direction which you can start walking towards and it just goes it goes deeper and deeper into more of a hole when you become more and more protectionist and yeah you've got economic warfare which is right just before as a precursor to full warfare so you do the you do your your, your tariffs and everything like that and then america gets like remember with the british and the americans we raise the taxes and then we um we have this little you could call it an economic warfare on the Americans, which are uh, being a little bit against the king. And then we have a warfare that happens. So the in, um, American industrial complex would be probably quite happy for these protectionisms to happen because m maybe in the future we may have um, this kind of thing happening. And he is quite fun, fond of plenty of drones, having little little guns on them, and all this kind of crazy um, Terminator shit that can come out of the problems. Um, government reform, he's mentioned that he two terms on a New York mayor is a terrible idea, so I guess he's pro for having longer terms. Now, I've made an argument for that politicians in power for only just a short amount of time obviously gives them very short-termist views and making them as popular as possible um i guess donald, donald trump doesn't really have any i guess he'd lo he would like to be more popular i think everybody would like to be more popular but it's um i guess it's kind of a dangerous thing if you could have donald trump in for the next 20 years in america and he could change the bills in terms of that but i guess it's quite hard to change uh the what is that book that was agreed by all those people at the start of America? Anyway, somebody can give us that. Sound. Sometimes I'm not that good at American history. Right, so... Yeah, it's... These are important things to mention and just to look at in terms of government um, control. If you look at President Putin, he he's went out of the political sphere, got some kind of uh puppet person in place and then he's come back and he's um still in charge so it's, it can be kind of um tricky to get people out of power once they have power they don't want to get rid of it and they're obsessed by the power and it's like lord of the rings with the with um taking over that that power it's like an addictive drug so it's kind of dangerous and especially if you are used to being this big uh my way or the highway way uh, man it's kind of uh, a little bit worrying because sometimes in the future you don't really want this big powerful man you want somebody who is going to create and negotiate good markets with people and have to have a free free market with peace in society so it is important in that respect now gun control uh, I am against gun control he's mentioned that in 2011 so there is nothing immoral about you protecting yourself um you're more than welcome to having a uh gun in your possession in immoral terms as long as obviously you're not using it against anybody else but there is no harm in you possessing um a gun there is nothing immoral about you holding a gun or there is nothing um immoral about any of those acts it's when you pull the trigger and it's your brain that's made that decision to fire against somebody that is when the immoral act has happened. So in terms of that, that is um, that is the moral theory about gun control. Now, when it comes to... The, there's certain things that people with melt, mental illnesses, yeah, you could say, okay, right, well, that wouldn't be kind of wise if we've got somebody who really wants to murder everybody to ha be in possession of a gun. So with a certain level of regulations and not enabling people that could um who, who are not really moral responsibility responsible um to possess guns then that could be fairly dangerous however people that who are morally responsible to possess guns w shouldn't really be a problem people who are acting in self-defense is not immoral um that's the argument and if um donald trump is with that as well then that sounds fairly okay um 
he I think there's some other mention quite some time ago. He's four sort we- weapon bans, waiting periods, and background checks. So um, the argument is that if you have an assault weapon which has a magazine that can fire out 30 rounds, what would be the purpose of that if you're just using it in a hunting sphere? Um, th- there, are, there are certain levels of arguments um, for and against that. You, I guess you could say, okay, it's a little bit irresponsible to ha- possess these ridiculous guns with this humongous amount of um, killing potential. Um, but in terms of like of if somebody is morally morally responsible, it's kind of fun shooting a gun that's got high um, high calibers with um, many machine rounds, and to go on a target practice, um, seeing how machines can really uh, do some damage and things like that. But obviously, um, I guess you would really need to have people who are in possession of these um, fairly highly dangerous weapons to have a certain amount of higher regulations to, for them to possess it. I don't think an outright ban is totally necessary, but there would be, obviously with somebody having a handgun, there's a certain level of uh, regulation that you would like to apply to that person compared to a bazooka or a tank. So it, um, it is, and in a self-regulatory environment, I guess that would be the wisest move. So let's move on. Let's move on. So, healthcare, Obamacare is a catastrophe. Um, this is from Donald Trump. We must uh, re- repel and re- get it replaced. Uh, I guess now that uh, Americans are in, are actually paying. They're all paying for Obamacare. I guess it's not very popular in those terms. I guess people that don't work probably don't have to pay for Obamacare, but. That is going to be repealed and replaced with something else in more of a private market, I presume. Um, <clears throat> uh, the moral argument is that really oneself and the family and your friends that you're looking after, you should be responsible for those people when you are looking into healthcare. There are certain charitable organizations that can look after you as well. Um, and there is a certain amount of responsibility that you should be taking upon yourself to be um, healthy. So uh, to um, expect that taxation should be taken away in the by the rule of force against some other people so that you can have it for yourself is kind of dangerous. Now... Homeland Security. So with Donald Trump, he's mentioned that our nuclear arsenal doesn't work. It's 30 years old. So I guess it's a fairly good point. America has a ridiculous amount of nuclear missiles and weapons for this all-out war with Russia during the Cold War, but really it's not really required. Um, There's the terminology of mutually assured destruction. Uh, you just need a, a certain amount of nuclear weapons and, and uh, en- enough to target every major city. And I think everyone's going to be quite happy to not go into a full-blown warfare because uh, you have the, cert- the military leaders of both sides knowing that they're going to probably decimate the entire structure of their tax pool, which they've got. It doesn't really make it much um, economic sense to do that from either side. Um, so he's going to re-strategize that, and I guess he's really focused on the war on terror, which can be tricky. He mentions that he's, he will be able to defeat um, ISIS and stop the Islamic terrorists. So he's going full belt into this war on terror, and uh, he mentions also in the negotiating table that Americans' interest comes first, no apologies. All freedoms flow from national security. So um, that's that's a fairly good um, argument. That is, once you can um, secure a certain area or land space, then you have the ability of free trade and marketplaces can form without uh, mafias and um, people trying to take advantage. However, there is still a power structure in place and we don't really necessarily look at the power structure that's in place that applies this taxation to the marketplace. So um, on one side you have uh, this 
this fairly good argument that says you'd need to have this um, force in place to protect the marketplace, but then you have the marketplace which um, is being taxed itself. Um, the better moral argument would be is to have the marketplace supply uh, for its own security, therefore it wouldn't require this big state to authorise and uh, require this taxation of, of it. So that's that little argument worked with. Now let's move on to immigration. So he has mentioned before half of the undocumented residents in America are criminals. I guess if you have been hard working and you've been working all your life in this state. No, oh, sorry, let me just mention beforehand. So in terms of a border, there's never been a border for, for many, well, only just for the last couple of hundred years, really. There's been borders and passports have been around for much less than that. So um, there has been this uh, great movement of people around places. There's um, there's counter arguments against um, like a shitload of immigration to a certain society, particularly if it's um, more inclined to the Western ideals. So if you've got a lot of um, Westerners in a certain country, and then you have a lot of load of people from a different ethnic community, they don't necessarily uh, mix in with the communities, and you do get a certain sense of us and them. And there is certain talk and mentions of, especially when America had this massive immigration for a number of years that it stopped for 40 years so that everybody could assimilate to a certain degree and then we could start again. So if you do get a certain amount of high flowing immigration into a certain area, it can destabilize it. People can be a little bit more uh, untru untrustworthy of people because they don't know the people as much. So there is some legitimate arguments against mass immigration, particularly if you are from a very different cultural background, which isn't uh, very moral. So, um, it, so yeah, you you do have a certain element of arguments uh, to have uh, restrictions on high amounts of immigration to areas. But if somebody is hardworking and does create, um, is very industrious and is good for the economy, then that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Donald Trump has mentioned this before in terms of anybody that um, gets through university and is uh, fairly good, they should be well, um, they should be invited to stay in America. So that's quite a clever little way if you keep the most intelligent people in America. Uh, then you do have the ability to increase the GDP. The, the, usually you would find the most in intelligent people would really be pushing forward the ideas side of things. So it's quite a clever move in terms of that. But when, it, when we get to the immigration side, so I've mentioned pros and cons against immigration. Um, but where we have people that have lived in an American society for a, n a number of years and f are fairly as uh, assimilated, then to start calling them a criminal is really not quite right. I, they're not doing anything really immoral in terms of of what they're doing. They're working. They're working peacefully. I guess we're not saying that they're being violent in any terms, way, or forms. So you can't can't really get them in in no, in that way um so then they're, they're not really criminals so that's the wrong words to use in that respect they are obviously just seeking a better life so you can always work the two perspectives in in that re in that realm um there is mention that uh, Donald Trump says that um a Mexican and Latin Americans send us crime rapists and drugs and uh, that could be argued as fairly true. There is certain uh, information out there which does tend to support those arguments. However, that it's not just a, a one-way road. There's there's a balance to all of these arguments. I'm fairly sure that there's some very good, hard-working Mexicans which come over the border and do really improve the the living standards of other people and do compete on prices 
there is um, certain arguments that the actual um, the lower end of society um, do struggle against um, this lower, um, harder working immigration which comes over the border. So if you think in terms of the black communi- uh, community, if you um, if you have a lot of these uh, Mexicans which are coming over the border and competing for wages, um, that is uh, competing in, against the uh, usually like the the lower end of the economic scale, and you could, potentially you could class that as black communities. But obviously there are white communities as well, and in those terms, there's not many in terms of Asian communities that are in the low scale. So um, it is fairly. Um, even though it's, it's it's a really interesting argument because it, on one side it's it just sounds really racist, but then on the other side you do look like you are protecting like black people's uh, jobs and the lower end jobs and 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 y- you can get favour from that side of the scale. So it's interesting how that's being worked into the government's sphere. This was always a no-no argument in terms of politics, and now it's being put to the forefront. Um, as Donald Trump is very protectionist, I guess he's going to really act out on um, these borders and the security, and he has mentioned about building this great will on a uh, wall on the southern border and having the Mexicans pay for it. I'd love to know how that's going to happen. There's always going to be a some kind of backlash to these uh, to any source of well, what was the word saying fuck you to another country <laughs> there's always a way of them saying fuck you back um, and yeah so this big layer defense uh, on the American border is kind of interesting there's, there's a lot of arguments for and against and it's it the, the weird thing about it is it's not necessarily all it, it, i can't really spot too much in the way of uh, racism because it can promote one race against the other and the one that one of the races has has been fairly prosecuted throughout time and the other one um is is, is not really like the, the major, major focus so it's just it's really interesting in and um it's interesting how the other politics the other candidates are going to argue against this one as well. So very, uh, very interesting things going on there. I'm not quite so pleased about him calling hardworking people that have not done any violence against any others uh, criminals. But let's let's move on anyway. Um, jobs. The real unemployment rate is 20%. I don't believe 5.6. He mentioned this in June 2015. Fairly good argument. I think if you do mention, you get a little talk around people in most Western countries, the the data which comes out is definitely a lot different to what is mentioned. People wait for jobs for very, very long periods of time now. In the past, you would be able to quit one job and get another job within a month or so. Now, you you potentially can be looking for half a year almost, and really require support of family and friends. So it's it's really it's really different, uh, and everybody knows at least one person who's quite badly struggling. So it's it's. Five point six percent just sounds like the normal like turnover of people just um, out of work and seeking work, just to changing jobs and stuff like that. Just normal ebb and flow. That that figure doesn't tie into what the actual state of people actually really searching for work and things like that. So it's interesting. There is um, a lot of data on the the facts and figures of how this data is being released in terms of um, America, I believe that there is something where they mention that people uh, people get registered, that they're looking for work, and then there's people that just don't register, they're, they're looking for work anymore, and they're just sort of written themselves off the grid, and that number is not accounted in any of the data which is supplied by the government, so it, do, it does really enable the statistics to be manipulated. Moving on... And he also has the protectionist ideals of foreign companies are taking in jobs from the US. 
Um, obviously, I'd, I'd mention uh, when when somebody uh, is very protectionist for a, an American citizen, that's going to be like, oh yeah, this is a really good idea. This is the greatest idea of all time to be protectionist. But um, when you look at protectionist ideas, especially Americans' ideas on protectionism, it has caused a number of problems in the past. And if you look at history, it definitely does create problems. So just be very wary of this. Um, it is really when something is like an electric shock of like, yes, that is the thing that's going to work us and save us. Really, you should sort of suppress that feeling and go right now. What is the potential outcomes of this if we do go down this route? It's like me saying, right, let's get a big bag of cocaine and let's do it right now. It might sound like the greatest idea, but if we start to think out over this a little while, we might think again. So, um, <clears throat> so just, just I always um, ask, just think about the protectionism ideas again. If you've got this great counter argument of the American uh, America and protectionism, then be free to message me back. Um, I've got something on principles and values from Donald Donald Trump. We've got if I run and win. Our country will be great again. Never give up. Look at the solution, not the problem. To negotiate well, prepare and know as much as possible. In the best negotiations, everyone wins. Failure is not permanent. Tell people you're successful or they won't know it. Surround yourself with people you can trust. Non politicians are the wave of the future. So, um, that's more like sort of little quotes that um, Donald Trump has mentioned. They all really sound pretty good. I, I really enjoy the one where he mentions about negotiating well, knowing as much as possible, and negotiation negotiating where everybody wins. I really hope that he can keep to that one as much as possible um, and not lean towards the protectionism sort of side of the scale. So if they're... If everybody's walking away from Donald Trump's negotiations and feeling really happy and thinking that man's a great guy and we can both mutually um, do well out of um, working with America, then um, maybe he he can create this fantastic place. But um, there's also been some other quotes. Sorry, I just need some water. There's also been some other quotes which... Um, don't really tie into that so where you are having counter quotes that sort of which counter when i say counter counter quotes that counter uh if you have quotes which go against what he's mentioning before then that doesn't really give us that much of a grounding it's a little bit worrying in those terms so just gotta be a little bit worried um in terms of social security he says he mentions that Cannot uh, change Medicare um, or Social Security um, if he wins the election. So that's all of those things stay in place. He's, he's when I mentioned before about changing the entire system. So families come first. I don't think that's going to really happen. He has to keep those things in place. I guess you're going to um, destroy your left side of the voting public if you do remove all those. Uh, social security benefits uh, tax re reform he's mentioned about having a very flat structure you would think to, to have just a very normal easy um, taxation system of a certain percentage for everybody would make a lot of sense not these ridiculous amount of tax laws and rules and regulations which um, obviously are more beneficial for corporations than us little Joes at the bottom and it will be a lot more easier for governments to orchestrate just a flat base um, uh, taxation system rather than to have this massive taxation um, office. But uh, he has mentioned this in the past. It would be very interesting if he could create certain, I think he's mentioned like certain brackets rather than just having having all of these different little weird taxation systems which occur. So that would be interesting. Uh, he's mentioned also cutting tax rate incentives, a, and sorry, cutting tax rates, incentivizing 
a strong national work ethic. So I guess in terms of uh, employment uh, taxes or maybe somebody starting their own business, so new starting businesses would have this lower tax break. So that would be kind of interesting and probably would be more beneficial for the economy rather than having high taxes. Technology. He has mentioned about rebuilding our infrastructure on time and on budget. So he would have a fair amount of experience of building things on time within budgets, building his hotel empires. So really, he's going to be the guy who's going to really get things done on time compared to a lawyer who's in charge of uh, in, in, in presidency. So yeah, um, interesting in, in those terms. And it, say if you've got all these corporate sort of um, money for money and all this uh, crony capitalism occurring, with all these budgets, Donald Trump's going to say, right, there's none of this um, delay tactics or anything like that. I know you might be giving me um, cakes with money underneath it and things like that. That's not happening anymore. Now you're going to do things on time and within budget, and I'm going to make sure things are working. So in terms of America, in that respect, for infrastructure planning, you could see Donald Trump being very successful in those terms. Right. So, yeah. So domestically... You, you kind of worry a little bit. So in more, <laughs> sorry, no, in, domestically you're, you're quite happy. I would say I'll, I'll be fairly happy in in terms of it, other than the what happens uh, in a protectionism sort of um, respect. But for him getting things done inside of America, he it everything, all the evidence would prove that he would be fairly good at getting the job done. Uh, on terms of war. And uh, peace. He has mentioned about getting plenty of boots on the ground to fight ISIS, hit the ground hard and fast, take 1.5 trillion and uh, award it to the people that have um, been a attacked by terrorism. So uh, from the oil fields. So very populist sort of views, very militarization of America, which it doesn't really fit in with peaceful societies that we want to create for our future. All ties in, though. There's At least you could say that you know what you're going to get with Donald Trump, whereby you would have President Obama c coming into power, and he would say that he's going to do something like create peace in the world, and then does the total opposite. At least you know that Donald Trump's going to just do what he, he's going to do, and you know pretty much where he's going to stand. Uh, welfare and poverty. One of the mentioned, he says, I don't like firing people. Work makes people better, which is a very valid comment. Food stamps should be temporary, not a decade on the dole. Uh, so, yeah, there's all of those. I, I, I guess that gives us a good feel and sense of what the Donald Trump era could be like. and. If you was a candidate trying to argue against Donald Trump, I guess the number one ammunition point that you could go for is his sense of protectionism and the way he gets in bed with the military industrial complex. On terms of like the borders as well, there's certain arguments that you're probably not going to work with him too much because there's great arguments and counter arguments. Uh, there has been a massive sense of immigration into America and a lot of the other Western countries. And sometimes people need just a little bit of time just to adjust to the massive change and uh, people to rebuild the sense of communities and not have these isolated community pockets of people, but just to have a, a couple of generations where people work together and know things. So, yeah. He's got some fairly good um, substantiated arguments in those terms. But when we get to protectionism and a big war in states, you're going to have, yeah, it feels, uh, probably the feel word is probably not the thing, but you're going to feel like you w Donald Trump is going to be the number one guy for economic warfare and protectionism. 
And that is the precursor of war. So that is where I feel there is some big worrying moments with Donald Trump, particularly where I mentioned in previous podcast, in my previous podcast of Donald Trump, where he is a man who is self-made and he has people that are always submissive to him and not necessarily on the same level playing field as him. So where Donald Trump comes against the Chinese president, he is bang on the level playing field now. And really, in a certain frame of time, China is going to be potentially more powerful than America at some point as well. So you have to concern yourself in terms of uh, Donald Trump, where he comes and meets people which are at the same level as him because he can he he's used to being the number one dog in town and when people just go right you you're now meeting your measure then we may have problems we have economic warfare we have he's already mentioned about raising uh levies and taxation for imported goods so this is all this is all um states of play which are going to happen potentially before before he's even come into the presidency so these would be the arguments against that i guess you've got the people the popular vote is going to be always highly for protectionism protection protecting um, america from high immigration protecting america from the the outsourcing of jobs protecting america from cheap import goods and currency manipulation it's it sounds good in theory but there is better ways to combat that and the best way to uh, combat businesses is in the competition whereas donald trump really should be competing with hotels not by raising taxes of his competitors but by improving the quality of and standards of his hotels and his business office complexes to be providing a higher quality service so that's where you would really want america to be to be more competitive to be less protectionism and providing better quality products and services compete um competing against all the emerging markets which it will be competing against um so yeah think in those terms of donald trump that is the president that you're gonna probably uh, get if you do vote donald trump ways be very wary be very wary of this man in those terms i one good thing is you know where he stands he's not he's not going to have this cloak where by president obama's going to say that he's going to do one thing he's going to push himself forward for world peace and he's going to really um improve the the lives of the globe and make america loved again you're really not going to get a loved America again. When you're going to go on holiday, I know when I meet up with Americans on holiday and things like that, <laughs> they're quite used to, um, the, the ones that are well-traveled outside of America are quite used to themselves being hated. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of sad um, that there's a lot of good that America has done to the world. Um, the individuals have done to the world, not really the states, but the individuals of america have done immense amazing things for the for the world so it's um it is an awful shame and really we we do not want to go down the path of protectionism it is the most credible danger which is potentially could happen to america right now you would think sometimes if you get one of these wishy-washy candidates in place that just are very normal middle of the road you may not get as many big problems as what you potentially could get with a high power president presidential candidate like donald trump so yeah that really rounds off my review of donald trump's policies i think i'll give him a little rest for the meantime and maybe look into other candidates because presidency of america is like what's going to happen in the world in the future so we are do to a certain extent when we look at presidential 
candidates. We are looking to what is going to happen in the future, and we do worry if certain things are carried out, especially when it comes to foreign policy, what would happen to um, the people and what are the effects of that. As always, when you're looking at candidates, always just look at it into all the information, what's all the things that can occur, and and really look at every angle when it comes to every policy, because there there isn't just one great side and a bad side. There is a number of justifiable arguments and counter arguments. As always, if you feel like I haven't really given Donald Trump a good review or I've given him too much of a positive review, please come back to me and put forward any arguments and I will be happy to hear them and we can keep the discussion moving forward. Thank you for your time and we'll chat again soon.